Good morning. I want to share with you today this whole thought of being God's child. This to me is one of the greatest parts of our theology and from time to time we see it in different parts of scripture. It's very clearly outlined for us in Romans chapter 8 verses 17 and thereabout. And here again in 1 John chapter 3 and the opening verses of that chapter. John says to us, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Now let's stop right there and think about it. We've been called children of God. Do you understand this? When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, however long ago that was, or however recent, you became a child of God. Oh, I know, if you talk to a universalist, they'll say, oh, well, God created all mankind. We're all children of God. That's not what the Bible's talking about. This is a very intimate, special relationship that is true for those who've been, yes, born again, as we saw yesterday morning. If you are someone who's been saved, if you're someone who's been born again, if you're someone listening to my voice who has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then you are a child of God. That is great, isn't it? How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. Now, that being true, we can talk to our God as a father. Now, that concept may horrify some of you. If you've always kept God a bit out there and away there, it may be a horrifying thought to think of him as your father, but that's exactly who he is. He is a loving heavenly father. He is the most perfect loving father you can even imagine. Now, that's very hard for some of you to get hold of. It depends what your father was like. If your father was a loving man, if your father was someone who could express his love and you felt it, then you know what I'm talking about. For many of you listening to my voice, you were never enriched with such an experience as a child. So you have to really get hold of this concept and you have to let the Holy Spirit help you. But God is your father because you're a child of his. And therefore you can go to him as a child would go to a father and discuss things and ask things and he will respond. This is what he wants, and I believe very often this is what the church of Jesus Christ has failed to teach her people. He is our Father, our loving Heavenly Father, longing to shower his goodness on us, longing to shower his gifts on us. Isn't it true that some of us, when we pray, we're almost afraid to ask him because we don't think he wants to give anyway? That is wrong theology. Know this deep within your heart. God, because he is your father and because you're his child, he delights to give to us. He delights to pour things out upon us. The snag is, sometimes we're asking for wrong things. And then in his love and in his wisdom, he withholds that. And that's what any loving father should do. But having said all that, each and every one of us, must remember that God is our Father. And it all happened when we accepted Jesus Christ. That's how we know how much He loves us. Then the Bible goes on and said, that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. We are His children. And the world thinks we're some crazy bunch. Especially if you're at all enthusiastic about your Christianity. What's wrong with you? Are you some sort of fanatic? It's fascinating, isn't it? You see, the world puts a totally different standard on us if we belong to Jesus. And I guess if we belong to Jesus Christ and go to church, we have to be very straight and very staid and never enjoy ourselves. Uh, to the contrary of that, i found that the more I've got into Jesus Christ, and certainly the more I've got into this ministry that I'm in, the more I enjoy Him. And the more I have fun. And I don't have to get drunk, and I don't have to have drugs. All I have to have is Jesus and some of his friends. And we have a tremendous time together. Yes, we have a lot of laughs. 
Yes, it is joyful. And I think that's what our God wants. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. And you remember Jesus warned you of this. He said, sometimes you'll find the world hates you because the world hated Him. It doesn't understand us. It doesn't want to put up with us. It finds that when it's all upset, we're at peace. It finds when it's full of hatred, we're full of love. And if that is true, then it begins to be very uncomfortable in and around Christian believers. And you'll find some people of the world are very, very strong in their opposition. Know this always. It is not an opposition to you. It's an opposition to the Jesus who dwells in you. What is in them hates what is in you. Now, once you understand that, you can love the person. Because sometimes it's rather strong. It comes on rather heavily. And you think, what on earth's going on here? What have I done to them? You haven't done anything. You're just being. You're just being who you are in Jesus Christ. And in that being, they feel uncomfortable. So they didn't know him. They don't know us. Then in verse 2, John goes on and says this. Dear children, now we are children of God. And what we will be has yet, not yet been made known. Now understand this too. We look into the New Testament and we see the resurrected Jesus. He had certain appearances. He appeared to his disciples. And when that happened, we know that he appeared in a resurrected, glorified state. But having said that, one day you and I will be resurrected too. But having said that, we don't fully understand what that resurrected state will be. He was not controlled by the material. He could appear and disappear at will. His body was not like ours, and yet it wasn't totally dissimilar. He sat down and ate with them. He talked with them. They recognized him. And in the body of Jesus, the marks of crucifixion were still there. And I assume they always will be. But we don't fully understand the resurrected state. Now, if you see that, then you know why John wrote what he did. Dear friends, now we're children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. Then he says something else. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Now, first of all, I don't think you need to think for a minute about looking like Jesus. What I think the Bible is saying all the time is, we will have an appearance, a characteristic like Jesus, a personality like Jesus. Now, this is very simple to me. If it's true that the Holy Spirit is in control of your life, if the Holy Spirit is directing you, if you're allowing the Holy Spirit to do what He wants, then He's producing fruit in your life. Now, if the fruit of the Spirit is a reality in you, then whatever happens, you are becoming like Jesus. You read over the fruit of the Spirit. You'll find them in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. If you study those two verses and really analyze what the Bible is saying, you will see a picture of Jesus. Therefore, if the Holy Spirit is producing His fruit in you, and his fruit in me, then we too are becoming like Jesus. And that's exactly what I think the Bible's saying. When we appear, we shall be like him. We shall have those characteristics. Now, if that's true, then we can wait for the day of resurrection. It's going to be one of reality. It's going to be one of truth. And you can rest assured that when Jesus comes, you will be like him. Then he goes on and says this, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I think we can go a step further here. When Jesus appears, we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, if we're still alive. If that is true, straight away, we shall see him exactly as he is. Why do I say that? Because at that moment, our knowledge will be perfected. Everything about us will be per per perfected we shall be like him. That's something that's very difficult for a human being to understand. So just get this in your mind. You will be like him in every sense. Now, what is God like? He knows everything. 
he moves everywhere. Everything about God is perfected. Now in that moment of resurrection, we too shall be perfected. Isn't that fantastic? We shall look at Jesus and we shall be like him in characteristic, in personality. It'll be a very special moment for every one of us. Verse 3. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as Jesus is pure. Now obviously, if you really study verses 1 and 2 of this chapter and really analyze what it says and make it part of your experience by the work of the Holy Spirit in you, the first thing you're going to do is purify yourself. It's rather what we said yesterday about righteousness. If there's anything wrong in you, you're going to put it right. Because you know that when you see him, you're going to be like him. And the point is, you don't know when you're going to see him. You only know that you will see him. It may be soon, it may be late. But one day you're going to be with him. And when you're with him, you're going to be like him. Then if there's anything wrong, purify yourself. You say, how do you do that? Back to what we said yesterday. Confession, repentance, asking for his cleansing. And with the blood of Jesus Christ, he will cleanse you completely. He'll wash everything away. He'll make you all new inside. There's another side to purifying. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says the Holy Spirit will be in us like a stream of living water just bubbling up within us. Have you ever had the privilege to drink from a mountain stream as it bubbles out of the ground? It's so clean. It's so fresh. It's so purifying. That's what I'm talking about. The Holy Spirit will just pour through us and purify and purify. Also, of course, as he purifies, he revives, he strengthens. But we need that purification because Jesus himself is pure. And we can't do this ourselves. If you try and purify yourself, you're getting into works. And you're going to spend an awful lot of time, an awful lot of energy getting nowhere very quickly. No, you have to rest in Him. And as you rest in Jesus, and as you rest in the Holy Spirit, let Him do the purifying. Be willing, that's what you need. It is your will that's involved. And you say, Lord, I want to be like you. And I know that's not possible of myself, but I'm just asking that your Holy Spirit would do it in and through me. And that needs to be a moment by moment, a day by day prayer, that the Lord can begin to purify you and remember it's from within. He always works from the inside out. And when he gets the inside pure, the outside's going to look beautiful. And one day when you see him, you'll be like him.